a tireless quest for a missing son unraveled one of post-war Italy's most disturbing crimes, a narrative of Satanism and violence that shocked and captivated the nation. In 2004, the Italian headlines were gripped by the chilling deeds of a group known ominously as the Beasts of Satan. While the United States had witnessed the decline of the Satanic Panic in the late 1980s and 90s, Italy, in stark contrast, found itself on the ascent of a similar wave through the 2000s. Although initial concerns were primarily focused on now debunked claims of ritualistic child abuse, a much darker and genuinely disturbing undercurrent was quietly gaining momentum in and around Milan, escaping notice until it reached a point of undeniable prominence. Andrea Volpi, arrested in 2004 for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, unraveled a sinister tale during his interrogation. Confessing to two additional murders dating back to 1998, these weren't ordinary killings. Andrea, along with a cult identified as the Beasts of Satan, orchestrated the deaths of two teenagers, Fabio Tallis and Chiara Marino, in a drug-induced ritual sacrifice. The escalating fear of supernatural malevolence prompted the establishment of Italy's Satan Squad in 2006. This specialized police unit was formed to investigate what authorities perceived as the growing threat of Satanism. Beyond the initial three killings, the Beasts of Satan found themselves accused of potential involvement in as many as 14 other deaths, highlighting the profound impact of their actions on Italian society. So let's take a look at what really happened in this shocking Italian crime case. The Beasts of Satan, the true story of Italy's shocking cult killers. Referred to as a band, a collective, or a cult, the mysterious group known as the Beasts of Satan encompassed diverse individuals including Andrea Volpi, Nicola Sapone, Paolo Leone, Mario Mattione, Pietro Guerrieri, Marco Zampoio, Eros Monteroso, and Elisabetta Ballerin. Their common ground lay in shared interests revolving around sex, drugs, metal, and death. The Midnight Pub in Milan, the city's heavy metal epicenter, served as their nightly meeting place. The unsettling saga began on January 17, 1998, when 16-year-old Fabio Tallis, a bassist affiliated with a band linked to the Beasts of Satan, and his 19-year-old girlfriend, Chiara Marino, attended a show at the Midnight Pub. This night marked a tragic turning point as they mysteriously vanished after mingling with fellow cult members. Tallis and Chiara were enticed out of the pub by Andrea Volpi, accompanied by at least seven others including Nicola Sapone and Mario Maccioni, who drove them beyond the city limits into the woods near Soma Lombardo, situated approximately 30 miles northwest of Milan. In the eerie woodland setting, the group gathered in a circle, indulging in alcohol and drugs. It was there that Andrea and his accomplices declared Chiara to be the sacrificial offering. Some sources suggest that Fabio was perceived as a threat to the group's leaders who sought to impart a lesson, while others claim Chiara met her tragic end due to her resemblance to the Virgin Mary. The night at the midnight pub would forever be remembered for the dark turn it took, revealing the sinister underbelly of Milan. Tragedy unfolded beneath the full moon as Chiara fell victim to a direct knife stabbing through her chest, piercing her heart while Fabio suffered a brutal beating with a hammer after attempting to intervene and rescue her. In a chilling account of the aftermath, Nicola Sapone, the supposed leader of the group, carried out a macabre ritual. He ritualistically inserted chestnut leaves into their lifeless throats, dipped a cigarette into their blood, and smoked it with a haunting declaration. Now you're both zombies. Try and get out of this hole if you dare. Subsequently, their clothed bodies were callously cast into a pit, left undisturbed for six years. Meanwhile, Italian investigators chalked up the couple's disappearance to nothing more than a runaway love affair, failing to investigate it at all. However, one person, Michelle Tallis, the grieving father of Fabio, refused to accept this narrative. Hours before the tragic events unfolded, Nicola had coerced Fabio Tallis into making a distressing call home, informing his father that he intended to spend the night with his girlfriend and would not be returning. Sensing something amiss during the call, Michelle urgently attempted to reach his son at the midnight pub, only to discover that Fabio and Chiara had already left for Soma Lombardo with their presumed friend and never returned. Over the next half decade, he tirelessly traversed the continent in search of his missing son, a father's mission. For a span of more than six years, Michelle Tallis, alongside Lisa Marino, the mother of Chiara, persistently sought official investigation into the tragic murders of their children, yet their endeavors proved futile. In a conversation with an Italian blogger, Michel provided insights into his determined quest for his son, recounting how, faced with the authorities' dismissive stance, he took it upon himself to conduct the search. I immersed myself in the heavy metal nightlife, he shared. There I encountered musicians, ordinary fans at first glance. Little did I know that these same individuals would later be exposed as my son's killers. 
Despite whispers circulating about the existence of a satanic sect, I initially dismissed them as mere rumors. Michel went on to elaborate on his unconventional methods, detailing how he distributed leaflets in various fanzines, hopeful that someone might assist in locating his son's remains. Actively participating in heavy metal festivals, he forged connections with individuals familiar with Fabio and Chiara, meticulously documenting every relationship he uncovered. By 2004, Michel had immersed himself so thoroughly in the Northern Italy heavy metal scene that he practically knew every person who had encountered his son. In the course of this relentless search, Michel Tallis grew convinced that Satanism played a role in his son's disappearance. No one can contradict me when I say that heavy metal and Satanism are closely linked. They're inseparable, he asserted. When it emerged that Chiara possessed a collection of satanic literature and paraphernalia in her bedroom, Michel had no doubt that his son had gotten caught up in something dark and sinister. Many of Fabio's friends displayed evasive behavior when questioned about his whereabouts, fueling Michel's belief that they were involved and concealing something. Over the following six years, he meticulously compiled a dossier of intelligence on them, unraveling connections, band affiliations, and acquaintances, capturing the beasts. On January 24, 2004, Andrea Volpe and his girlfriend, 18-year-old Elisabetta Ballerin, perpetrated another appalling murder, this time targeting 27-year-old Mariangela Pizzotta, Andrea's ex-girlfriend. Police discovered Mariangela's lifeless body in Golaseca, a small town not far from Soma Lombardo. Andrea later confessed to shooting Mariangela in the throat, but finding her still alive, called his cult's leader, Nicholas Apone, for assistance. Together, they transported Mariangela to a greenhouse at Elisabetta's parents' residence where Nicola ruthlessly beat her with a spade before burying her alive. Andrea admitted to orchestrating a seemingly friendly dinner with Mariangela, concealing his sinister intention to end her life due to her extensive knowledge about the sect and the prior murders of Fabio and Chiara. Subsequently, Andrea and Elisabetta, under the influence of a potent mix of cocaine and heroin, attempted to dispose of Mariangela's car by driving it into a nearby river. However, their plans were thwarted by a car crash that led to their apprehension. When Michelle tuned into the local news and saw the unsettling report regarding the brutal murder, alarm bells set off in his head, given Andrea Volpi's past involvement in a death metal band with his son. Urgently, he contacted the police, prompting a meeting. The story Michelle Tallis shared was peculiar, remarked Teniente Enzo Molinari of the Carabinieri. Yet it wasn't just a narrative, he substantiated it with a very persuasive collection of paperwork and photographs he had amassed over the past six years. He conducted a genuine investigation into the disappearance of his son and his son's girlfriend all on his own. Equipped with Michelle's comprehensive dossier, the police proceeded to interrogate Andrea about the disappearances. When Andrea was confronted with the information provided by Michelle, he eventually capitulated. In a bid for a potentially reduced sentence, he led investigators to the remains of Chiara and Fabio. While Michelle's pursuit had finally led to the answers he had been seeking, they had also set a cascade of revelations into motion. Mario Maccione, one of Fabio's schoolmates, confessed to fatally beating Fabio with a hammer. In a startling disclosure, he unveiled that the boys were involved in a larger satanic sect known as the Beasts of Satan. Disturbingly, he also disclosed that Andrea Bontad, a drummer, had been coerced into committing suicide by the group. In September 1998, Bontade, heavily intoxicated, tragically took his own life by crashing his car. As a result, authorities expanded their probe into potential connections between the group and a broader network of Satanists in Italy. The Beasts of Satan faced suspicion regarding their involvement in up to 14 other unresolved cases within the same region and time frame. These cases encompassed other alleged suicides, disappearances, and violent deaths, with purported connections to members of the group. The first suspected case linked to the beasts was that of Christian Frigerio, a 23-year-old construction worker from Brerio, and purported former group member who went missing on the 14th November 1996. Angelo Lombardo, a 28-year-old caretaker of the cemetery of Legnano and an acquaintance of certain group members was also thought to be one of their victims, having been burned alive in the cemetery on the 14th of December 1999. Similarly, Alberto Scaramuzino, an 18-year-old carpenter from Dairago, was discovered burned in his car in the woods near Arcanate on the 23rd of May 2004, and investigators have suspected his death to be tied to the cult. Three more individuals, Andrea Ballerin, Doriano Mola, and Luca Colombo, all of whom were friends or linked to members of the group, are also thought to have suffered at the hands of the beasts of Satan. All three were found hanged to death between 1999 and 2004. However, 
conclusive evidence linking the beasts of Satan to these incidents has never been established. Mario Maccioni, in later accusations, implicated group members Nicola, Andrea, Paolo, Marco, and Eros in all of these crimes. Nevertheless, these allegations have been consistently denied by the accused individuals and there has been no actual evidence beyond circumstantial links to the group to be able to pin any of these deaths on them. The Roll of Metal The unfolding case sent shockwaves through Italy, a predominantly Catholic nation. Responding to the situation, one priest, Don Aldo Bonaito, established a helpline to assist concerned parents and children troubled by the specter of Satanism. Expressing his stance on the matter, he also advocated for the prohibition of death metal music. If music aligns itself with nefarious deeds and death, it should be halted, he insisted. This incident was the latest in a series where extreme metal music was held accountable for violent acts committed by teenagers. Recollections lingered of the alleged secret messages within Ozzy Osbourne's lyrics and the ensuing controversies surrounding his track, Suicide Solution. In 1996, the parents of Elise Marie Poller brought the band Slayer to court in the U.S. following the murder of their 15-year-old daughter in what was claimed to be a satanic ritual mimicking the band's lyrics. The case was dismissed by a Californian judge in 2001. Norway witnessed the burning of over 40 churches in the 1990s by fans of the even more extreme black metal genre. A favored band among the Beasts of Satan sect in Italy was Deicide, an American death metal group fronted by Glenn Benton, a self-proclaimed Satanist with an upside-down cross branded into his forehead. Deicide delves into the occult, with one of their most popular anthems being Kill the Christians. Glenn Benton, no stranger to controversy, and with several murders linked to his fans, staunchly denies any accountability for the actions of their followers. He emphasizes, I say don't blame people like me and Marilyn Manson because we never said, hey, we're going to be role models for all your kids. That ain't what this is about. It's about entertainment. It's worth noting there is no evidence supporting the notion that regular kids can transform into malevolent entities solely through exposure to music. Nevertheless, scholars specializing in adolescent psychology and music have often expressed concerns regarding potential effects on children already grappling with psychological issues. Professor Don Roberts of Stanford University suggested that perhaps children already predisposed to violence or depression should be kept away from death metal. What the music may well be doing is simply reinforcing beliefs that they might have started with in the first place, he contends. The aftermath. Subsequently, Andrea Volpi and his accomplices faced trial in the northern Italian town of Busto Arzizio in the Lombardy district. The verdicts were swift and severe. Andrea received a 30-year prison sentence, surpassing the initial 20 years sought by the prosecution. Pietro Guerrieri received a prison term of 16 years, while Mario Maccioni, who had confessed to the crimes and fully cooperated with authorities, was acquitted due to his secondary role. Nicola Sapone, suspected by the police as the mastermind behind the Fabio and Chiara killings, was handed a life sentence. The remaining four known members of the cult, Paolo Leone, Marco Zampoio, Eros Monterosso, and Elisabetta Ballerin, received sentences ranging from 24 to 26 years for their involvement in all three murders. Following Andrea's sentencing, Lisa Marino cast blame on Italian authorities for disregarding her pleas for assistance. We've achieved justice for Chiara. Now Andrea will have to endure 30 years behind bars, she expressed. If people had heeded my calls seven years ago, Mary Angela might still be alive today. While the beasts of Satan, particularly Andrea, never contested their crimes, the motivations underlying the murders remained questionable. Despite assertions from investigators and the Italian media attributing the murders to Satanism, the reality suggests that Andrea Volpi was a discontented young man fixated on eliminating those he perceived as slighting him. The influence of drugs also played a significant role in Andrea's mindset and likely contributed to his homicidal actions. Elisabetta Ballerin was released from prison in 2017 and now works in a restaurant near Brescia. She claims to have embraced a new life, shedding the shadows of her past marked by death and losses that she says she no longer recognizes herself in. Mary Angela's father, Silvio, says he has forgiven her and has shown her surprising support for the next chapter in her life, even appearing by her side in some interviews. Andrea Volpi regained his freedom in April 2020 after serving just 16 of his 20-year sentence. Supposedly, Andrea has aspirations of becoming a teacher, having completed a degree in educational sciences that he started during his incarceration. Um, yeah, good luck with that one. I don't see any school hiring him to work for them anytime soon. 
Somewhat ironically, Andrea even claims to have undergone a conversion to Christianity during his time in prison. Francesca Kramis, the attorney for one of the Beasts of Satan members, contended that her client's inclination toward death metal triggered the tragedy, suggesting it initially started as a game they all participated in. They listened to death metal, she stated before the trial. These are guys facing severe problems, and they convinced themselves that they had the power to take others' lives. It began as a game but ended in tragedy. Personally, I think this argument is pathetic. Metal music didn't make these criminals into murderers. Any more than being interested in true crime like you watching this at home means you're suddenly about to go out and murder somebody. The Satan Squad. The beast of Satan crimes unfolded against the backdrop of growing apprehension in Italy, where concerns mounted about the allure of Satanism and the occult among the country's youth. In February 2005, a Roman Catholic university affiliated with the Vatican initiated a two-month course focused on diabolical possession and exorcism, catering to priests and seminarians. In response to the revelations stemming from the Beasts of Satan investigation and trial, coupled with heightened public unease, Italian law enforcement expressed its commitment to establishing a specialized unit concentrating on emerging religious sects, named the Squadra anti Seta, translating to the Anti-Sex Squad. More commonly, this unit has been dubbed the Satan Squad by the media. The unit's primary focus was to be on groups, especially Satanists and other ritualistic entities, potentially engaged in violent activities. This specialized force would orchestrate nationwide investigations into these potentially hazardous religious movements, comprising experts such as psychologists and priests well-versed in occult matters. The Vatican extended its support through Don Oreste Benzi, a prominent expert on Satanism and the occult within its ranks. Don Benzi stated, We will deploy priests with expertise in the realm of devil worship and the occult to assist the anti-sex squad in addressing this escalating issue across Italy. Past incidents have witnessed desecration of churches and loss of lives due to devil worship. It extends beyond murders, encompassing the psychological influence these sects wield over young individuals, diverting them from traditional social values and exposing them to various horrors. We estimate the presence of at least 8,000 satanic sects in the country with over 600,000 members, and these numbers continue to rise. Hence, the church is more than willing to contribute, he added. A police representative in Rome explained, the Department of Public Security determined the necessity for a group to address Satanism and sex in Italy. In several instances, criminal activities, including murder and sexual offenses, have been observed. However, not everyone has been in support of the unit. Civil rights organizations have continually expressed concerns that the anti-sex squad could inadvertently target the millions of Italians belonging to other minority religions who, despite peculiar practices and beliefs, pose no harm. As far as I can tell, this Satan squad is still in operation to this day. And with that, our exploration of the Beast of Satan case comes to an end. What did you think about this disturbing true crime case? Was it one you were familiar with before watching this video? I personally had never heard of it before I began researching it. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and drop a comment down below to let me know your thoughts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. Between May and September 2008, the Russian town of Narofominsk became the hunting ground for a serial killer known ominously as the Narofominsk Maniac. A traffic warden from an affluent family, Andrei Surikov was initially arrested in 2001 after taking part in a violent assault. However, due to some of the strange actions and statements he made after his arrest, such as stating he wanted to own a wallet crafted from human skin, he was sent to a psychiatric ward instead of being imprisoned by the Russian authorities. But in 2008, after being released from the hospital, Surikov would go on to commit a string of harrowing murders that he claimed were done on the orders of Lucifer himself. Stabbing his victims to death with a stiletto, Surikov was known to leave stolen items from previous victims at the crime scenes of his latest attack, as if taunting the authorities by making it clear these were the actions of a single serial killer. It's worth saying up front, there is little information on this particular case I've been able to find outside of a handful of Russian news stories, which has meant I've had to rely heavily on Google Translate when writing the script for this video. As a result, there's a high chance some of the details are slightly wrong or misinterpreted. I just thought it was worth letting you know that up front. So without further ado, let's get stuck into this disturbing case together. Andrei Surikov, 
the Russian maniac who murdered for Lucifer. Born on April 2, 1978 in the Russian town of Narofominsk, Surikov was adopted at a young age by a wealthy family. Holding significant influence, his adoptive father was a successful businessman, while his adoptive mother headed up a meat processing plant. Raised under their loving care, Andrei Surikov had an ideal childhood. By the time he was 20, he had managed to secure a position as an inspector for the Russian traffic police. During his time at the department, Surikov stood out to his colleagues who regarded him as incorruptible, with bribery seeming completely out of the question. Viewed as diligent and disciplined, it didn't take long for him to rise to the role of sergeant. And by the age of 23, Surikov was able to acquire his own apartment and a brand new Audi A6. By all accounts, he was living a comfortable life with a well-respected and well-paid job. But then in 2001, after meeting Dmitry Korotkov and Alexei Zagriadsky at a party, everything changed. Violent times. Korotkov and Zagriadsky were friends who had initially met while incarcerated for vandalism. Both had been separately arrested for setting fire to apartment doors and bizarre acts of hooliganism. The duo moved into a life of petty crime after their release. But it wasn't until they met Surikov that they found the missing link needed to execute their biggest plan. As the criminal duo chatted with Surikov over drinks, the pair presented an opportunity to utilize Surikov's position as a traffic officer in a scheme to rob individuals driving high-value foreign vehicles. Despite his perceived morality by his police colleagues, Surikov seemingly liked the idea, as by all accounts he jumped headfirst into it. Discussions soon transitioned into active preparation, with the trio attempting to acquire a firearm for use in the robberies. They initially attempted to purchase one from military personnel posted near Narofominsk, though this plan did not unfold successfully, turning their attention to an organized gang near Moscow to acquire the weapons instead. They arranged to travel to meet them in Obninsk and purchase firearms from them. However, this plan also failed to go as expected by the trio of amateur criminals. When they met up with the hardened gangsters, rather than doing a deal, they took their money giving them nothing in return and threatened to kill them should they ever return or encounter them again. However, rather than deterring them, these threats instead cemented their desire to acquire firearms, now for their own protection from the violent gang they had crossed. They altered their initial scheme, focusing on stealing cars to dismantle them and sell off the parts to help them raise the needed funds. Days of reconnaissance led them to select a prime stretch of the Borovsko Highway between the villages of Davidkovo and Bolshoye Svinoria. They armed themselves with a guitar string fashioned into a noose with wooden tips, a knife, a police baton, and Surikov's traffic police inspector uniform. As dusk settled, Surikov adeptly wielded his baton along the Borovsko Highway, waiting for the perfect target to emerge. It was Denis Eltsov, the driver of a brand new Audi A6 who fell into their trap, stopping at an intersection in what he believed was an official traffic stop. Presenting themselves as law enforcement, the trio accused Denis of drunk driving and diverted him towards the local town of Aprilevka for examination. Doing as instructed, they accompanied Denis to the town in their vehicle. As the car came to a stop, Surikov got into the car and hooked the guitar string around Denis's neck. But the chaotic situation quickly went out of control resulting in Dennis being stabbed multiple times with a knife. Remarkably, Dennis survived the assault and managed to escape the vehicle, quickly flagging down another motorist and alerting them to the attack by someone impersonating a police officer. The trio quickly fled the scene in their own car, but it didn't take long for Russian authorities to catch up with them. Despite their meticulous planning, the amateur criminals had made a massive mistake. They had carelessly used Surikov's own car for the crime without altering its registration, allowing for their quick arrests that same night. As the trio faced charges of robbery, forming a criminal group, and attempted murder, the case received widespread coverage in the media, with police warning drivers to stop only at official checkpoints manned by legitimate traffic police officers. While police and the media didn't seem surprised by the involvement of criminals Korotkov and Zadriadsky in this vicious attack, the presence of a seemingly law-abiding moral traffic officer perplexed everyone. Given his affluent background, authorities struggled to understand Surikov's motives for involving himself in such a criminal scheme. It wasn't like he needed the money, so what was he getting out of it? Timofeik, his superior at the traffic police station, speculated that perhaps some unknown family circumstances had motivated him. Pre-trial, Surikov began to make strange statements about Satanism and the occult, including mentioning a desire to possess a wallet crafted from human skin, which only added to the confusion surrounding his motives and involvement. Ultimately, while Korotkov and Zagriatsky were deemed mentally fit, convicted, 
and sentenced to lengthy prison terms, Surikov was adjudged unfit to stand trial and was committed to psychiatric care instead. Although it has never been substantiated, there was a prevailing belief in the Russian media that Surikov's influential adoptive father may have played some role in helping him to evade imprisonment. A serial killer emerges. After being released from psychiatric care, Surikov returned to his hometown of Narofominsk. It would appear that his strange, almost ritualistic ramblings that got him institutionalized had only grown stronger in the years he was locked up, at least if his version of events are to be believed. After returning to Narofomisink, he instantly began devouring literature about Satanism and the occult, becoming fascinated and obsessed with the darkness in their pages. His obsession soon manifested into rituals involving stabbing dolls with knives, and sadly, it wouldn't be long before his targets escalated to real living humans. Attacking his victims in the daylight, Surikov's methods involved choking his victims with a rope before fatally stabbing them with a stiletto and pilfering their jewelry and other items of interest, such as sneakers. As a macabre signature, he even left behind a personal item belonging to a previous victim at each new crime scene. On the afternoon of May 18, 2008, Surikov set his sights on his first victim, 16-year-old Maria Veselova, as she returned to her parents' country house after celebrating her birthday in town. According to Maria's mother, Elena, she had been walking with friends and was expected home by 7 o'clock. When she failed to return, her parents attempted to reach her phone to no avail. Unbeknownst to them, when Maria had separated from her friends, Surikov launched his attack on her near the Latishkaya railway station, strangling her before inflicting multiple stab wounds that ultimately killed her. She had just turned 16 and we came to the dacha for a few days to celebrate her birthday, said Elena. That evening we were preparing to return to Moscow. Despite extensive search efforts, the girl's body wasn't discovered by the police until the following day. Only a month later on June 21st, Surikov struck again, murdering 22-year-old Marina Karpenko near the Alabino railway station. Marina's husband, Alexei Karpenko, recounted that in the morning, his wife left for an exam at a branch of the humanitarian academy she was enrolled in, located near the railway station. Marina called me at half past ten in the morning. She said she had already finished her exam and asked me to meet her, Alexei recalled. Opting not to drive to the academy to avoid getting stuck in traffic at the railway crossing, he requested Marina to cross to the other side to meet him. According to Alexei, Marina's journey from the institute was just a ten-minute walk. However, she had to traverse an industrial zone in a forest belt near the railway. I drove up and dialed her number, but the call dropped. At that time, I didn't think much of it, Alexei remarked. He attempted to reach her multiple times afterward, but her phone was already switched off. I couldn't even entertain the thought that something could happen to her, expressed Alexei. My friends and I organized a search ourselves because the police refused to accept a report. I hoped to find her alive. It wasn't until the following morning, during their exploration of Marina's intended route, that they stumbled upon her lifeless body. She was lying face down in the grass, her husband recounted tearfully. I rushed to get a doctor, but it was too late. Surikov had viciously stabbed her multiple times before attempting to hide her body with a handful of branches in the forest. Alongside her body, a ballpoint pen belonging to the first victim, Maria, was discovered, presumably in an attempt by Surikov to ensure authorities understood the same killer was responsible for both murders. Then in September, Surikov found his third victim in 20-year-old Olga Parakina, a nurse at the Orbita boarding house. On the afternoon of September 10th, Surikov broke into the nursing home and ambushed Olga in the treatment room, stabbing her to death. Olga frequently worked alone in the treatment room, making it likely he had been observing her for some time before commencing his assault. He then moved her body to a nearby office, where it was discovered the following day by her colleagues. According to Nina Mikalina, Olga's mother, Olga had been severely ill the day before the attack, claiming she had only gone into work to receive vacation pay that day. This time, a watch stolen from Maria was found with the body of Olga, again ensuring the police knew the same killer had struck again. With this pivotal third victim, Surikov had officially crossed the line to become a serial killer. Capture and Trial In April 2009, Surikov donned a mask and attempted to rob a grocery store in Petrovskoye village. Threatening a saleswoman with a knife, he stole a couple of dollars worth of Russian rubles before fleeing the scene. Alerted by the commotion, a group of local villagers pursued Surikov capturing and restraining him as he tried to get into his car. Police then arrived to apprehend Surikov, and it wasn't long before he was connected to the string of unsolved murders from the previous year, which he vehemently denied any involvement in. Following his arrest, Surikov's apartment was raided, 
and police uncovered personal belongings from all of the murder victims, such as a watch belonging to Olga which he had given to his girlfriend. Unable to deny involvement anymore, Surikov admitted to his crimes, but insisted that he had been commanded by Lucifer to carry out the killings. Claiming the devil made me do it seems like a weak defense for a serial killer. But given Surikov's past incarceration due to supposed mental illness, authorities had no choice but to take his claims seriously. Well, seriously in the sense that they had to consider he truly believed the devil had told him to commit the murders. Not that, that it had actually happened. By 2010, Surikov faced trial at court as a serial killer. He displayed disinterest and apathy throughout the proceedings, even as friends and an ex-girlfriend testified against him. For the majority of the trial, he sat with his back to the courtroom participants, concealing his face with a hat. Among the testimony, Surikov's former girlfriend recounted how he had requested her assistance in providing an alibi, urging her to tell the police that he had been with her during the time of the murders. However, she had refused to aid him. Surikov remained mostly silent throughout the proceedings, with his sporadic utterances revolving entirely around the devil and his disdain for the church. Was this a sign of his true delusion and obsession? Or part of an orchestrated plan to avoid being imprisoned yet again? Surikov did not contest his guilt. When asked by the prosecutor if he committed the alleged actions, the maniac tersely responded with a yes, before continuing to ramble about how Lucifer had instructed him to commit the killings. Due to his past hospitalization and his continued irrational claims, Surikov underwent psychiatric evaluation at the Serbsky Center in Moscow. He received a diagnosis of schizophrenia, with psychiatrists noting he displayed extreme aggression. Ultimately, they deemed him incompetent to stand trial due to insanity. All four doctors at the Serbsky All-Russian Research Institute who assess Surikov believe he is extremely aggressive, cruel, impulsive, and exhibits persistent delusional behavior, asserted the defendant's lawyer contending that his illness began to worsen after the cessation of his previous treatment. Nina Mikolina, Olga's mother, reminded the court that Surikov made conscious efforts to conceal evidence and even hide bodies, implying that he was aware what he was doing was wrong. She, alongside other family members of the victims, initially contested the insanity ruling that absolved him of criminal responsibility, suspecting it was all a ruse by a master manipulator to avoid trial and imprisonment. I wasn't convinced by the findings of the forensic examination stated Marina Karpenko's husband, Alexei. We believe he's attempting to evade accountability. Ultimately, the judge dismissed their requests for a new medical evaluation, and none of the victim's families chose to appeal the decision. Surikov was deemed to pose a significant threat to society and consequently confined to a psychiatric institution for compulsory treatment, where he remains to this day. Referred to as the Narofominsk maniac by the media, outside of his claims about the devil and the occult, there are still huge questions surrounding why this seemingly upstanding police officer gave up everything for a life of crime. Surikov seemed to switch overnight from apparent normality and morality to extreme violence and cruelty. Ultimately, this vicious predator took three lives and destroyed countless others through his despicable actions. So, what do you think was really going on in this case? Do you think Surikov truly believed he was in communication with the devil and being ordered to kill? Or do you think he was just using this as a ruse to deceive authorities and avoid going to prison after he was caught? Why do you think Surikov chose to leave previous victims' items at the crime scenes of his next victims? Did he want to be caught? Did he want to make sure nobody else could claim responsibility for his murders? Did he want to be known as a serial killer? Or was it perhaps part of some strange ritual? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below. As always, thanks so much for watching. There isn't too much detail about this case out there, so I'm sure there is more information that might help us make some sense of this. If I come across anything, I'll include it in a follow-up video at some point. Until then, you have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In the dimly lit streets of Barrio Rivadavia, near the Buenos Aires Cemetery of Bajo Flores, a chilling encounter unfolded on Sunday, April 11, 2010. Rodrigo Escura, a 27-year-old philosophy student, found himself in a harrowing situation, confronted by a group of young people led by Marcelo Alejandro Antelo, known as Marcelito. Escura, his new bicycle, wallet, and phone already taken from him, pleaded, I'm not going to give it to you, you'll kill me first! But Antelo, unyielding, retorted, you ask me, son of a bitch! Before firing a fatal shot into Escura's chest with a 9mm gun. 
as Kura's desperate venture through the dark streets hinted at a deeper struggle, one driven by insatiable cravings. Little is known about the depths of his desperation, but it led him to a fatal encounter in the hallways of the Rivadavia II buildings. Cornered, he surrendered his belongings without resistance, but resisted when Antello demanded the drugs he had just purchased. Despite his compliance, it seemed Escura's fate was sealed. Unbeknownst to Escura, his tragic demise marked the beginning of a horrifying spree orchestrated by Antelo. This murder was merely the first in a series of heinous acts, between four and six, with additional failed attempts, perpetrated by Antelo over the next five months. Shockingly, these crimes were carried out as part of what investigators referred to as a pact with San La Muerte, the saint of death. Antelo had made a sinister promise to the saint one death a week in exchange for protection for himself and his family, ensuring a constant supply of drugs. This dark covenant set off a wave of violence, leaving a trail of victims and terror in its wake. The San La Muerte Killer, a pact with death. Chapter 1, A Spree of Violence Before the brutal murder of Escura, Marcelo Antello's criminal history had been relatively minor, devoid of any significant violent incidents. His upbringing was marked by a tumultuous family life, characterized by his grandmother's alcoholism, his father's addiction issues, and his mother's tendency to resort to violence. In early 2010, at the age of 22, Antelo, also known as Marcelito, had a brush with the law when he was pulled over by a patrol car from the 38th police station while driving alone in a stolen car. Although initially charged, he was ultimately released. Digging into his records, the criminal recidivism registry revealed a prior incident from February 2009 where he was declared in absentia by a court in Lomas de Zamora for failing to appear as a witness in a robbery case. These incidents constituted the extent of his criminal history until he embarked on his disturbing spree of violence. At the time of Escura's murder, Antelo resided in a house marked with number 1018 in the Rivadavia neighborhood, cohabiting with a group of fellow addicts known locally as the Kindergartners. Living under the same roof as Jorge Mancilla, the owner of the house, Antelo's relationship with Mancilla soured leading to his eviction. In the wake of this, he vowed revenge. True to his word, Antelo wasted no time in seeking vengeance. On the night of June 24th, he ambushed Dario Romero, another former housemate, shooting him in the hand with a shotgun. Despite Romero's writhing pain, Antelo refrained from delivering a fatal blow, instead reveling in his cruel act. Antelo's thirst for revenge escalated further on August 2nd when he targeted Mancilla's residence. He called out Mancilla's name, demanding his presence and when met with silence, he fired at the house. Six days later, in the early hours of August 8th, he returned to the scene. This time, without uttering a word, he rang the doorbell. When Mancilla opened the door, he was met with Antelo's cold stare. It was the last sight Mancilla beheld before Antelo ruthlessly ended his life, shooting him in the head with a 9mm pistol. Chapter 2 The Fortunate Escape of a Mechanic A few hours after the chilling murder of Mancilla, Marcelito remained at large in the neighborhood, fueled by a thirst for vengeance. His target this time was the mechanic Mario Chiero, who, in reality, owed nothing to Antelo, but rather to one of his acquaintances, who he owed 300 pesos for a car repair job that had never been completed. For context, that's around $15. Yet for a bloodthirsty figure like Marcelito, such details were inconsequential. Antelo confronted Chiero at his workshop, situated in a garage beneath the mechanic's residence demanding the money. When Chiero refused, Antelo, without uttering a word, retrieved a 9mm pistol from his clothing and attempted to pull the trigger. One, two, three times he tried, but the pistol jammed, failing to fire. Taken aback, Marcelo inspected the gun, managed to unlock it, and fired a shot into the air to confirm it was working. However, this delay allowed Chiero to retreat upstairs and barricade himself inside his home. Instead of retreating, Marcelito began firing at the front of the house all while bystanders remained passive, failing to intervene or alert the authorities. Eventually, Chiero's wife, from a window, negotiated with Antelo. She offered him 150 pesos, all the money they had, in exchange for him leaving them in peace. Reluctantly, Antelo accepted the offer. However, as the woman descended to hand him the money, he issued a chilling threat. If I ever see your husband again, I'll kill him, he warned before casually walking away, blending into the neighborhood as if he hadn't just terrorized an innocent family. Chapter 3. More Tragedy and the Pursuit of Justice The final two murders orchestrated by Marcelo Antello echoed the brutality of his initial crime, where Rodrigo Escura fell victim. On the night of August 15th, Marcelo Cabrera, 28, and Pablo Zaniuk, 26, 
like Escura before them, navigated the dim passageways of Barrio Rivadavia in search of drugs. In a chilling repeat of his modus operandi, Marcelito and an unidentified accomplice intercepted them in a corridor near house number 107, close to Korea Street. Threatened at gunpoint, both young men relinquished their belongings, but tragically, it did not spare their lives. Zanyuk met his end with a fatal shot to the face, while Cabrera suffered nine gunshot wounds to various parts of his body. At this point, law enforcement was actively pursuing Antello, eventually leading to his capture 13 days later. On the morning of Saturday, August 28th, officers from Police Station 38 spotted him on the corner of Esteban Bonarino and Oceania in the Rivadavia neighborhood. When ordered to stop, Marcelito responded with gunfire, but thankfully the police managed to subdue him. Upon his arrest, it was discovered that Antelo was carrying a 9mm pistol accompanied by two fully loaded magazines, bearing an intact serial number and a federal police shield. Further investigations confirmed that this weapon had been stolen from an officer on March 26th, just a few months prior. Moreover, ballistic tests revealed that this pistol was the same one used in the fatal shootings of Escura, Mancilla, Cabrera, and Zaniuk. According to the case investigators, Antelo could potentially be linked to two additional murders in Bajo Flores between April and August 2010. However, conclusive evidence to support these claims remained elusive. Chapter 4. A Pact with Death The true nature of Marcelo Antelo's sinister spree began to unravel after his arrest, hinting at a connection with a pledge he had made to San La Muerte, a saint not recognized by the Catholic Church in exchange for protection. Close relatives of Antello disclosed to investigators that he was a devoted follower of this obscure saint and that he had entered into a dark covenant, promising one life a week in return for San La Muerte's sheltering embrace. A witness revealed a chilling detail. Marcelito had allegedly recorded himself with Ezcura's pilfered cell phone, articulating his vow to kill a person every week as part of his pact. Strangely, this phone never surfaced, leaving behind a mysterious void. Following Antello's apprehension, journalists delving into the heart of the Rivadavia neighborhood were met with an impenetrable wall of silence. Amidst this silence, journalist Liliana Caruso managed to extract a crucial testimony, shedding light on the unsettling promise. A relative of Antelo, who chose to identify himself as Jorge to avoid repercussions, cautiously revealed, Some things that are said are true, others are not. I didn't see him very often due to my work commitments. What I can affirm is that the young man initially embraced evangelism and everything seemed fine. However, at some point he became entangled with a sect worshipping San La Muerte. That's when he started uttering strange things, engaging in peculiar activities. He vanished from here and was never seen again. San La Muerte, commonly known as the Saint of the Good Death, exists on the fringes of religious recognition tolerated by the Catholic Church. This religious figure finds a fervent following in the Argentine Mesopotamia, the province of Buenos Aires, and select provinces in the northern regions of the country. The supposed devotion of Marcelo Antelo to this saint, coupled with his vow to commit murder in exchange for the saint's protection, may appear to be rooted in the cult of San La Muerte. However, the true essence of this cult diverges significantly from the perception that Antelo's actions might suggest. Despite its intimidating name and image, San La Muerte is merely one among several revered figures in a popular saint's pantheon, which includes Gauchito Gil, Defunta Correa, and even contemporary icons like Gilda and Potro Rodrigo. These figures coexist alongside more traditional religious entities such as the Blessed Seferino Namuncura and various incarnations of the Virgin Mary, explains anthropologist Alejandro Frigerio, a researcher at Conicet. San La Muerte, positioned at the less orthodox end of this spectrum, is perceived as a potent spiritual entity capable of aiding troubled devotees. Those who practice this devotion, increasingly prevalent across the country, do not venerate death as an antithesis to life. Instead, they anthropomorphize it, endowing it with human qualities, portraying it as the most just of the saints, the one who ultimately embraces everyone, regardless of their wealth or poverty. Nevertheless, certain prayers to this saint can lead to misinterpretations and subsequent misguided actions. One such prayer reads something like this, though keep in mind I had to use Google Translate to turn it into English so it may be slightly inaccurate. Saint Death, spirit skeletal and strong, beyond measure, your majesty like Samson, indispensable in moments of danger, I invoke you. Certain of your benevolence, I pray to Almighty God, grant me all I seek from you. Let remorse grip the one who harmed or cursed me. May they face your wrath instantly. For those who deceive me in love, I beseech you to bring them back to me. And if they disregard your mysterious command, mighty spirit of death, let them feel the might of your scythe. In games and business, I appoint you my best counsel, and to all who stand against me, may they forever meet defeat. O oh, Saint Death, my guardian angel. Amen. 
Chapter 5, Condemned. In the wake of his capture, a lengthy legal battle culminated in Marcelo Antello receiving a life sentence on September 14, 2012, handed down by the Oral Criminal Court No. 27 of the Federal Capitol. The sentence held him accountable for the heinous murders of four individuals, Rodrigo Escura, Jorge Mancilla, Federico Zaniuk, and Marcelo Federico Cabrera. Additionally, Antello was convicted for causing injuries to three others, Jorge Diaz Armas, Jorge Quiero, and Dario Romero. Throughout the proceedings, Marcelito maintained a bowed head, seemingly engrossed in silent prayer, refusing to exercise his right to address the court. His defense, in a bid to overturn the verdict, lodged an appeal challenging the constitutionality of the life imprisonment sentence. In a pivotal ruling in June 2014, Chamber 3 of the Federal Chamber of Criminal Cassation dismissed the defense's appeal and upheld the original sentence. Regarding the claim of unconstitutionality, the judges asserted that the sentence imposed on Antelo does not exceed the bounds of proportionality considering the enormity of the injustice and the degree of culpability exhibited by the accused individual. Conclusion In the chilling saga of the San La Muerte killer, Marcelo Antelo's gruesome crimes and the terrifying promises he made to the obscure saint have left an indelible mark on the annals of criminal history. Through a series of heartless acts, he shattered the lives of innocent victims and plunged an entire community into fear and despair. The relentless pursuit of justice, however, prevailed, leading to Antelo's conviction and life imprisonment for his heinous deeds. This harrowing tale serves as a stark reminder of the dark corners of belief and devotion, where individuals can be driven to unimaginable lengths by their warped convictions. In the aftermath of this disturbing chapter, the affected community remains scarred but resilient, determined to heal and rebuild, united in their shared determination to ensure that such horrors never recur. The actions of the San La Muerte serial killer were extremely brutal and disturbing, but whether Marcelito really had made any sort of pact with the saint of death, as claimed by his family and the police, is ultimately unclear, especially given most of his crimes appear, at least to me, to be focused exclusively around drug addiction and revenge, rather than anything particularly occult or ritualistic. What do you think of this haunting case? Would you like to see me cover more obscure international crimes and serial killers such as this Argentinian story? If so, let me know down in the comment section below. As always, thanks so much for watching and please like and subscribe as it really does help the channel to grow. I appreciate all of your support so far and hope we can continue to build a great community of mystery and true crime enthusiasts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. Throughout European history, genuine tales of monsters are surprisingly commonplace. For centuries, Christians were firmly convinced that entities like witches, ghosts, demons, and vampires weren't just fantastical fictions, but were real creatures actively engaging in lethal and disturbing acts. And there is no more quintessential an example of this than the story of Peter Stump. In 1920, Montague Summers, an English clergyman and author, rediscovered a long-forgotten pamphlet in the British Museum that provided intricate insights into Stump's life, including his crimes and the subsequent trial after his capture. Almost all of our knowledge about this event is derived from these 16 pages. The original broadsheet published in German underwent an English translation and only two copies exist today, one in the British Museum and another in the Lambeth Library, both located in London. No copies of the original German pamphlet have ever been found. After offering guidance to werewolf hunters on how to effectively dispose of a captured beast, the pamphlet delineates the gruesome deeds of Peter Stump, a wealthy German farmer. On the fittingly ominous day of October 31, 1589, a sizable assembly congregated in the German town of Bedburg, situated near Cologne, to bear witness to a gruesome execution. The condemned individual, Peter Stump, had openly admitted to entering into a diabolical pact with the devil. But his aspirations weren't for wealth. Rather, he coveted the ability to transform into a werewolf. His shocking litany of crimes spanning 25 years encompassed multiple murders and acts of cannibalism, including the butchering of pregnant women and multiple children, one even being his own son whose brain he had consumed. Described as a hellhound unlike any other by the local authorities, Stump even confessed to engaging in incestuous relations with his daughter as well as sleeping with a succubus demon gifted to him by the devil himself. However, upon closer examination through a rational lens, Stump's story perhaps takes on a different, yet no less monstrous dimension. 
especially as his confession coerced through horrifying torture which paved the way for one of the most brutal executions in European history, leaves lingering doubts as to whether he actually had any involvement in any of the murders he was accused of. As history intertwines with folklore, the unsettling question arises, was Stump truly guilty of the crimes he faced, let alone being a werewolf? Or was he a victim of a far more sinister plot, the Werewolf of Bedburg, the disturbing true story of Peter Stump? Peter Stump's early life remains shrouded in mystery, leaving historians perplexed. Born around 1530 in the village of Eprath near Bedburg, Germany, his name might not have even been Stump at all. Alternately referred to as Abel Griswold, the moniker Stump could have originated from the fact that his left hand was amputated, leaving only a stump. Regarding his adult life, it's believed that he was a prosperous farmer, a widower, and a father to two children. A daughter named Beale, and a son whose name has been lost to history. Character-wise, up until his exposure as a werewolf, he seemed to be well-liked. The English pamphlet described him as such. He would go through the streets of Cologne, Bedburg, and Eprath, in comely habit, and very civilly as one well known to all the inhabitants thereabout. And oftentimes was he saluted of those whose friends and children he had butchered, though nothing suspected for the same, the scarcity of concrete information regarding Stump's life. Assuming that was indeed his name, presents a significant challenge. Compounding the issue, church records from the relevant period were lost during the ravages of the Thirty Years' War. No surviving interrogation transcripts or court records exist. So to delve into Stump's particulars, historians have had to rely on a compilation of pamphlets and handbills. The most extensive among them is the English pamphlet published in 1590, purporting to be a translation of a German work, although the original document has yet to be located by historians. But these posthumous accounts of his life are also suspect, tainted by falsehoods, inaccuracies, or excessive sensationalism due to the widespread notoriety of his case. What follows is, as far as reports at the time were concerned, a true account, those of a sensitive disposition might want to click off the video now, however, as the story I am about to tell you is a particularly nasty one. The Wolf In the historic town of Bedburg, Germany, a series of gruesome incidents involving cattle mutilations and monstrous killings marked by torn open abdomens unfolded between the years 1564 and 1589. Initially attributed to wolves by local villagers, the situation soon took a darker turn. Before long, women and children started vanishing, only to have their mutilated corpses discovered days later. The superstitious townsfolk swiftly attributed these events to unnatural forces at play. Fear permeated the community, restricting people to their homes and compelling them to venture out only in armed patrols. Those daring to travel between towns reported stumbling upon abandoned, dismembered limbs of victims in fields. The mere disappearance of a child prompted parents to assume the worst, attributing it to the relentless wolf preying on another victim. For a quarter century, the onslaught persisted, claiming the lives of numerous men, women, children, cattle and sheep devoured by the malevolent creature. Over time, a pervasive belief took hold, solidifying the conviction that a monstrous entity was responsible for the disappearances. Whispers of a werewolf initially originated from the harrowing experience of a local girl who, in the face of danger, invoked divine intervention and was rescued by a stampede of cattle. Within this chaotic scene, villagers encountered a wolf, severing its left forepaw with a sword. Then, in 1589, an extraordinary incident unfolded. Children at play in a meadow witnessed the sudden emergence of a wolf from the woods, seizing a young girl by the collar of her coat. Thankfully, the wolf's attempt to attack was thwarted as the stiff collar prevented its teeth from piercing through. The terrified children raised the alarm, compelling the creature to abandon its prey and flee. Pursuing villagers soon had the creature cornered, but as they closed in for the kill, the wolf vanished, and in its stead stood Peter Stump. Whether the transformation was witnessed, or if Stump coincidentally found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time remains unclear. Observing that Stump was missing his left hand, just like the wolf that was previously fought off and believed to be the demonic creature. The villagers had no doubt that Stump and the wolf were one and the same entity. Outside of his missing hand and alleged appearance at the scene, Stump's culpability rests entirely on his subsequent confessions, extracted through the use of torture and the looming threat of further torment. Thus being apprehended, he was shortly after put to the rack. But fearing the torture, he voluntarily confessed his whole life. The Confession Stump confessed to having practiced black magic since the age of 12, claiming that the devil had rewarded him with a magical belt or girdle. This enchanted accessory allowed him to transform into the likeness of a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large which in the night sparkled like fire, a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. 
Stump asserted that removing the belt reversed the transformation. When questioned about the belt's whereabouts by a local magistrate, he claimed to have left it in a certain valley. Despite sending a bailiff to retrieve the belt, it was never found. Surprisingly, the absence of the belt and inconsistencies in Stump's story did not raise concerns with his accusers. Under the threat of more torture, Stump confessed to being an insatiable bloodsucker, admitting to the gruesome killings of at least 14 children and two pregnant women, among numerous others, over a 25-year period. His descriptions of the pregnant women's fate were particularly distressing, detailing the ripping of fetuses from their wombs before eating their hearts panting hot and raw, which he later described as dainty morsels. Stump even shockingly admitted to the heinous act of murdering his own son, whom he had deceitfully lured into the forest. Using the enchanted girdle, he transformed into a wolf and proceeded to cruelly slew him and eat the brains out of his head to staunch his greedy appetite. This revelation carried particular significance because the untimely demise of his son had initially shielded Stump from suspicion. On top of murdering his own son as a monstrous serial killing wolf, Stump also confessed to having an incestuous relationship with his 15-year-old daughter, as well as a distant relative called Catherine, that he claimed to be his mistress. In addition, Stump even admitted to sharing his bed with a succubus that was sent to him as a gift by the devil himself. The Execution Stump's trial unfolded as one of the most horrific acts of punishment in European history. Initially fastened to a wheel, his body endured the excruciating ordeal of having the flesh torn from it in ten different places, a gruesome act executed with red-hot pincers. The same merciless procedure was then extended to his arms and legs. Proceeding with the grim spectacle, the executioner wielded the blunt side of an axe, systematically breaking all of Stump's flayed limbs. This brutal act aimed to ensure he couldn't crawl out of his own grave and continue to wreak havoc. The grotesque spectacle culminated with his beheading, followed by his body being burnt on a pyre. Catherine and Beale faced a similarly harrowing fate having endured being flayed, strangled, and burned alongside Stump's body. As a precautionary measure against potential wolfish behavior, a torture wheel was erected on a pole featuring the figure of a wolf and crowned by Peter Stump's severed head. Contextualizing wolves and witches, the sensational nature of Stump's transgressions and the ensuing punishment captivated the collective imagination. Despite the prominence of Stump's trial and execution, it was not an isolated occurrence. Between the 15th and 18th centuries in Europe, the convergence of famine, plague, war, and religious turmoil fostered superstitious beliefs. These encompassed apprehensions regarding witches, predominantly women, and werewolves, predominantly men. While accusations of lycanthropy occasionally overlapped with but were considerably less frequent than witchcraft, some European regions lack any recorded instances of werewolf trials. In England, where wolves were nearly eradicated in the 16th century, historical records contain no accounts of werewolf trials. Similarly, the Mediterranean region of Europe has no documented cases. European werewolf panics were concentrated in areas inhabited by wild wolves, wooded regions, and communities with a strong tradition of livestock herding, as observed in Germany and France. Apprehensions initially rooted in concerns about actual wolves preying on animals and children gradually morphed into fears of demonic wolves. In cases where rabid wolves were present, werewolves might be scapegoated for the perceived crimes. The most comprehensive catalogue of werewolf trials in early modern Germany comprises approximately 300 cases. While a substantial number, it pales in comparison to the staggering 30,000 to 45,000 executions for witchcraft recorded in Germany during the same period. Charged individuals accused of being werewolves were predominantly male, with a majority being shepherds. According to Brian Levac, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Texas at Austin, wolves were viewed as strong, violent, and aggressive traits usually associated with men. In most accounts pertaining to Stump, the man purportedly transformed into a wolf through the use of a wolfskin belt bestowed upon him by the devil. By removing this belt, Stump could revert to his human form. Levac highlights that all werewolves utilize some form of instrument for their transformation, aligning with the characteristics of male witchcraft. He notes, all of them use some sort of instrument in their magic, such as Stump's use of a magical belt whereas the lower forms of village magic allegedly practiced by female witches consisted mainly of charms, curses, or various concoctions. Theories and Speculations The motivations behind Bedberg's conviction of Stump as a werewolf remain shrouded in mystery. Some historians posit he might have been a murderer, perhaps even a cannibal with crimes so gruesome that people could only rationalize them with supernatural explanations. It's entirely possible that werewolf legends in general originated as explanations for the presence of historic serial killers. Whether or not Stump was actually a killer, it is probable that any local wolf attacks on livestock or people were unjustly attributed to him. 
Rumors surrounding Stump, his daughter, and his mistress likely fueled the fervor, accusing a widower entangled in familial relations whose son vanished under dubious circumstances seemed fitting for a community seeking a monstrous scapegoat, possibly tinged with envy due to his wealth. Alternatively, Stump's innocence remains a possibility, casting him as a victim and a scapegoat. The timing of his trial during the Cologne War, a clash between Protestants and Catholics, definitely raises suspicions. The region was plagued by marauding mercenaries during this period, and unsolved crimes could have fueled ominous folktales of a werewolf haunting the forests. Consequently, Stump might have been singled out as a ritualistic means to purge the community of perceived evil through his execution. Furthermore, there is a strange detail that appears incongruent with historical facts, hinting at an underlying layer beneath the surface story of Peter Stump the werewolf. Both the 16-page pamphlet and the German broadsheets emphasize the presence of members of the aristocracy at Stump's execution, including the new archbishop and elector of Cologne. This singular fact implies the existence of a concealed motive. Relevance may be found in the block of years during which Stump was purported to have committed his crimes, which coincided with a period of internal spiritual and political turmoil. The electorate of Cologne experienced upheaval with the introduction of Protestantism by the former Archbishop Gebhard Truxess von Waldberg. Stump, an early convert to Protestantism, participated in a war that historians contend unleashed unbridled violence among soldiers on both sides, leading to a plague epidemic. In 1587, the Protestants suffered their final defeat, and the new Lord of Bedburg, Werner, Count of Salm Reiferscheid Dyke, transformed Bedburg Castle into the headquarters for his Catholic mercenaries, resolute in re-establishing the Roman faith. The werewolf trial of Stump may have served as more than a persuasive tool, albeit not gently, to encourage the remaining Protestants to convert to Catholicism. It seems improbable that Germany's elite would attend a conventional werewolf or witch trial, which were, in fact, commonplace. Instead, it is likely that, having outlined Stump's alleged and truly outrageous crimes, the elite orchestrated a grand public spectacle. With ensured visibility to the general public, the nobility embarked on their rides to witness the disembodiment of a werewolf, a Protestant rogue, an embodiment of anti-Catholic spiritual darkness. One might argue that no public relations stunt since has equaled the uniqueness and sheer morbidity of the execution of Peter Stump. Conclusion In the twilight realms where history meets myth, the tale of Peter Stump, the Bedburg Werewolf, remains a haunting enigma. As we peel back the layers of time, the shadows of uncertainty persist, leaving us to ponder the true nature of this 16th century figure. Stump's life, mired in accusations of unspeakable crimes and dark pacts, becomes a canvas reflecting the fears and anxieties of a society grappling with the unknown. The execution of Stump, marked by its brutality, stands as a testament to an era marred by religious strife, political tensions, and an insidious intertwining of folklore with the judicial system. Was he a predator, a victim, or merely a pawn in a larger, more sinister game? The intricate dance between historical records and the spectral whispers of the past makes it challenging to discern truth from embellishment. As we navigate through the foggy corridors of the Cologne War and the werewolf trials that marked the 17th century, the resonance of Stump's story with the broader context of witch hunts becomes apparent. The line between reality and myth blurs, reminding us of the fragility of historical narratives and the human inclination to craft tales that mirror our deepest fears. The Bedburg Werewolf, like other figures in the cryptic gallery of history, beckons us to question, to reflect, and to acknowledge the complexity of the human experience. Whether Peter Stump was a genuine menace or a casualty of his times, his story lingers as a cautionary reminder of the ever-shifting interplay between truth and legend. As we close the chapter on this enigmatic narrative, the shadows persist inviting us to peer into the darkness and contemplate the enduring mysteries of our shared past. As always, thanks so much for watching, and please like and subscribe and comment down below if you enjoyed this video. It really does help the video to gain traction and the channel to grow. I'm interested to know what you all think about this video, as it's a blend between my usual true crime stories, the supernatural, and the weird and dark side of history. If you like it, I'll try and cover more cases like this in the future. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.